So uh, I think we can start right now, okay? So welcome everybody to our first field seminar in the semester, and uh, it's it's been a very long time, and we are since our last uh, field seminar, and we are very glad to have Professor Fang Yuli from Kennesaw State University uh, give us this this talk. And Dr. Li is an assistant professor with the Department of Electronical and Compute Computer Engineering at Kennesaw State University. Before joining KSU, he was a postdoc fellow with the College of Engineering at University of Georgia. And he received his PhD in geophysics from University of Oklahoma in 2017. And his master and a bachelor degree were obtained from Tsinghua University and uh, Beihang University, respectively. His research interests uh, include seismic signal processing, subsurface imaging, quantitative interpretation, machine learning, distributed computing, Internet of Things, and uh, cyber physical system, a lot of things. And uh, Dr. Lee is a uh, recipient of the 2020 J. Clarence Kasher Award from the SCG. And uh, I have known him for a very long time, and uh, I'm very happy to have to, to he, he can accept my invitation. And I was say sorry to everybody, we don't have pizza this, this time. So <laughs> if you can bring your own food, it's all very, it's all very welcome. Okay, so let, let's welcome um, Dr. Lee for today's talk. And his talk will be about distributed sensor networks based on real time and in situ subsurface imaging. Okay, it's your time for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you Zhilong for the introduction. And uh, my name is Fang Yuli. I'm a AP with the ECE department at the Kennesaw State University. Today, my talk would be related with my postdoc's works uh, when I was in the University of Georgia. So the title is Distributed Sensor Networks Based Real-Time and in situ Subsurface Imaging. And first, I want to say I'm so honored to have this opportunity to present my work to your laboratory. And uh, I'm very happy to do this. So this is the outline. I will briefly go through the motivation and the related works. And uh, I will focus on my work related with real time and the in situ subsurface imaging. And I will give a, a short conclusion and that will be my talk. So the real time in situ subsurface imaging I also call it RISI for short. So this uh, methodology, all we can think about this is approach is based on the distributed sensor networks. Distributed sensor networks inherently, it has the ability to do the real time and the in situ computing. We think about this is a mesh network. This mesh network can do the sensing, can do the computing, can do the communication based on the distributed sensor networks. And in that way, we can do the real-time imaging and we can do the time-lapse monitoring. So we can do a lot of things to characterize the subsurface structure and the dynamics. And uh, why can we do that? Because we think about we have the computer, uh, sorry, computing and the communication unit in the node. So we call it the intelligent nodes. So those intelligent nodes can record and process the seismic streaming data in the real time. And that they can communicate with each other using wireless and even wired. So we can build a mesh network and we can build infrastructure network. We can do our application for the online, sorry, onshore and offshore. Even we can do some planetary exploration projects. And then those nodes can be used to uh, collaboratively calculated the 2D, 3D, even 4D subsurface images. And then why we are doing this? The motivation is here. So consider about the relations between the data, the computation, and the communications. So now is the era of the big data. So nowadays, we, we know there's too many different types of sensors. You know, the data grow exponentially. So there will be more and more data. And for the storage and the computation, typically we double the storage and the double the computation in 18 months. And the, but when we come to, come to the communication part, the bandwidth, the bandwidth is always a bot bottleneck for uh, our compu computing tasks. It is limited by the spectrum. 
even now we have the 5G, 5G may be available in the near future, but for the geophysics applications, I don't see the 5G will be available for us soon. So in CGU computing, it's necessary in the, inter in the IoT, the Internet of Things. So typically we can call it a fault computing or edge computing. So where is this uh, uh, diagram shifting approach? What we can do is like, we're trying to deal with the big data computing in the distributed networks. So previously we need to collect the data and uh, transfer, tra transmit the data into a computing center and uh, ask the uh, supercomputers to do the calculation, to do the task. That would be slow and uh, expensive. But in the, when we use the distributed networks, we, do, we can do the in situ computing. So that can be real time and efficient. So I will show some related words about this part. Compared with the existing systems, there are a lot of advantage of the distributed real time in situ computing. So for the existing system, typically the stations are fixed. And then as I mentioned, you know, the data needs to be transmitted to and uh, precise at a central location. And then for the system deployment and the maintenance and the support cost that can be very high. And then the last one is like, you know, the, they delay the, the delivery of the final images with the updated velocity model. So kind of the, uh, the velocity model updates is kind of very slow. But for our system, the RSI system, first thing is kind of flexible. We can use various self-organizing seismic network. And then we can get the smart in situ and real-time seismic data. And uh, it is a low cost and a long term kind of deployment. And the last thing is like we can get the timely imaging results that can be used for imaging the subsurface dynamics. So these are the advantages of the, our RISI system. Now I want to talk about some related works because this work has been done during my postdocs at the UGA. Before I joined the UGA, my uh, supervisor, Dr. Wen Zhan Song, he did some uh, previous work. So between 2007 and 2009, when Dr. Song was with the Washington State University, they got a, a project funded with the NASA JPL. So with NASA, they managed to develop this called the space in situ sensor ride. So this kind of using the helicopters to airdrop those seismic sensors on a volcano. This is the kind of the total uh, sensors they develop at, the at that time. You can see uh, their ash detector, their antenna, GPS, air, uh, and uh, this is the communication uh, a computing unit, and uh, they're also the seismic uh, sensors. So they use this uh, uh, kind of unit and uh, use based on the helicopter to deploy this on the volcano areas. And the later, also got another grant from the NSF. This called the volcano SRI, the volcano seismic real time imaging. So they can deploy this. Uh, sensors on a volcano area and uh, image the image the lava structure. So in that way, they can modify whether there would be kind of uh, uh, volcano eruptions. And then they deploy the, all the sensors around this volcano so they can do the real-time imaging at that time. And the, the methodology they did uh, in that time, it, it is typically a travel-time tomography. Uh, they have the processing stage and the computing stage. In the processing stage, uh, pre-processing uh, filters are used, uh, and then they develop the uh, STA, LTA based uh, arrival peaking method, and then they locate the uh, event uh, locations, and based on the retracing methodology, they can uh, do the tomographic inversion and based on the tomography, they can image the whole uh, volcano areas. And uh, these are the related works. And uh, based on the related works, uh, during my postdocs, I have been actively working on the 
real time and in situ subsurface imaging. So we uh, have achieved a new uh, process in two aspects. The first one is the hardware. So we develop a new hardware. And uh, in the terms of software, uh, besides the tomography, we have developed the uh, ambient noise imaging, subsurface, uh, subsurface imaging based on spec, and we also developed the micro seismic event uh, localization method. Okay, so during that time, uh, that uh, project was funded by NSF. The name is called Real Time Ambient Noise Seismic Imaging for Subsurface Sustainability. So we gave a nickname for this system. We call it the Subsurface Camera. Because look at this. So this would be our distributed sensor networks. And this kind of a structure of a camera. We can take the real time and the in situ image and pass the image following the sensing, processing, computing, and the control. So this very looks like a camera. And we can get a very high efficient imaging results. And in terms of applications, uh, we have done like ambient noise imaging and the uh, earthquake and the micro seismic location, infrastructure monitoring, and the underground uh, security. So underground security is like uh, we can develop uh, the human activity underground, so we can track where that happens, so that can be used for uh, kind of security purpose, and. Uh, our system can also be deployed on in Mars and do the planetary exploration. We have some collaborations with the NASA JPL. And the first part, I want to briefly talk about our hardware. So this is a prototype system. So here, previously remember uh, that uh, kind of uh, unit was quite large very heavy, you cannot uh, easily deploy them. So uh, when I joined the uh, UGA, we developed this kind of hardware system. And uh, here, there is a unit. In, in this uh, unit, we have the GPS uh, to get the timestamps, to get the locations. And uh, we have the Raspberry Pi and the communication and the uh, computation unit. And uh, we have this uh, solar panel, uh, that kind of renewable energy. The solar panel would charge this battery, and the battery would charge this uh, uh, this unit. And this is the seismometer. And in the hardware part, this is how they are connected. And in the software part, we designed the, uh, the data format. We designed how can we connect the data, and how do we process the whole data system. So this is our prototype system. And this is related with data acquisition and the storage strategy. So here, uh, what kind of data information we can get. And then here is related to how we deal with the synchronization. Because even we have the GPS, you know, the synchronization between the different the sensor nodes are kind of challenging. And uh, this is the uh, table structure. The table structure is related with what kind of data we are storing. And then in our experiment, the sampling rate is 500 hertz. So that means we can get a very high frequency. So that we use for the very shallow subsurface image. Later, you can see some uh, examples about those parts. And uh, we got uh, our data uh, uh, package. We can get uh, every 375 milliseconds the data package. But uh, that's the kind of one by one, that's the smallest amount. So typically we can get the data package in every two minutes or five minutes. So it depends on what kind of application we are working on. In the first step of uh, the seismic imaging system uh, is the, to build the initial velocity. So based on the hammer test, here we can see we put the sensors in a small garden outside our research, our building. And we do the hammer test. And all the sensors can automatically pick the arrivals. And based on the arrivals and based on the communications between all the nodes in the network, we can build this initial velocity. 
Once we get the initial velocity, we make a uh, kind of some experiment. So we simulated some uh, earthquake events in the uh, kind of in our UJ campus. And then this is also automatic arrival peaking. And based on arrival peaking and the velocity model, what we can do is like a, we also derive a, a 3D real time uh, visualization. And uh, you can see the locations and the depths are the calculated results of the different uh, earthquakes. And then the size of the balls are the kind of magnitude, how strong of that event. So this is the 3D visualization of the system. And the, the first application we use that system is called the ANSI project. This ANSI is, the, is short for the real-time ambient noise seismic image. So for the ambient noise, typically we collect all the data and do the you know, calculation in the, uh, with the post-processing procedure that in a, a supercomputer or in a processing center. But in our case, you can see those nodes are connected. So we can do the noise, we can do the calculation just in, in situ, you know, different nodes can transfer, uh, sorry, can transmit uh, their uh, recorded data in every five, five minutes. And uh, they can do some in individual calculations. For example, in one node, the node can read the data, pre-process the data, and they can communicate, I mean, the data with the Time stamps. Just uh, you can send out uh, some requests like uh, what kind of time stamp I need, and then they can do the communication with each other, and uh, they can do the calculation locally, stack the results, and uh, also locally apply the time frequency analysis, and uh, uh, we can calculate uh, the uh, the travel times and uh, calculate the phase velocities and uh, calculate the local velocity maps. So here for one node, it can only communicate with its neighboring nodes. So we can build this partial velocity map. And the later, all the nodes will communicate over the whole networks, and then we can get the final velocity maps. So this is the late, in the end, we can get the aggregated velocity maps. And this is a workflow. So in this workflow, Kind of, we worked the, together with Dr. Fan Chi Lin from the University of Utah, and he is an expert in this uh, econo tomography area. And uh, with these different uh, kind of frequencies, for example, we use uh, from 0.5 hertz to 2 hertz. With different frequencies, we can not only get the uh, one uh, kind of uh, Without these slides, we can get actually a 3D velocity model. So in the end, we can get this 3D velocity model over the whole kind of distributed sensor networks. And there is a short video I can explain to you. Okay, this is related with our project. So first thing you can see, we can transfer all the data to a cloud center. So this is all the embedded system. Each one you can think about as a node. And this is a simulation result. Those uh, green curves, they are the transmissions. They are the communication paths. So with this communication, every two minutes, we can generate this velocity map. And uh, we can also integrate this uh, Google map with our velocity model. And we can project this velocity map on the Google map in the real time to see the result. And the later, we did some experiment in the UGA campus. So there are like 10 uh, uh, stations there. And using these 10 stations, we build a small mesh network. And these are the different imaging uh, results. Let's go back a little bit. So firstly, we get the 2D velocity maps, and then we can extend that to the 3D velocity map. And so next the work is related with a micro seismic source. Okay, how are you Okay. 
though this microseismic source localization will use the TRI. Any questions? I can hear someone is talking. Everyone mute. mute. Okay. If no more questions, let, let me just uh, keep going. Uh, in this micro seismic uh, source localization, we kind of develop a, a method based on the time reversal imaging, the TRI methodology. So this is the workflow. You can see after pre-processing, we select the time frame. Then from the time frames, we can do a time reversal and uh, do the forward modeling. And uh, we can stack all the different uh, forward modeling results from the each node. And after stacking that, we can get the uh, source, microseismic source imaging. So that would be the source location. And uh, there are some related words already. For example, uh, Nori, Nakata, and uh, Nori and uh, Bayroza in 2016, they developed this called the GMRTM methodology. So in this methodology, what they did is like, suppose there are N nodes. So they first stack all the wave fields from the N nodes together. And then they, they collapse the time axis. So that would be the final imaging result. So, but for Norris method, they didn't consider about this as a distributed sensor network. And then in 2015, uh, Jun Zhe Sun from the University of uh, Texas, Austin, they developed this uh, hybrid cross correlation uh, TRI condition. So they considered the, the distributed uh, sensor networks. So what they did is like they first uh, divided the whole N sensors into the K clusters. And each K clusters would have the M receivers. So you can see they first uh, do the uh, this multiplication of the wave fields in the small clusters, and then they do the cross correlation in the the whole sensor networks, the, all the n sensor networks, and then in the last step they do the uh, time collapse. So that would be the imaging condition from the soon 2015. But from these two parts, you can see they are very similar. It's like their last step is trying to uh, stack temporarily. But in our situation, like if we're doing that, that means we need to transfer the wave field across all the distributed networks. So that would be too heavy for the communication cost. So in 2019, we propose a new imaging condition. You can see the main difference is like we first collapse the time. So in this way, we are not transmitting the wave field over the whole networks. We are transferring the stack, the imaging over the network. So in that way, we can save a lot of communications. And these are the, uh, the simulation results. So I found you, I have a question. Okay, no problem. So, so previous, previous slides. So yeah. you, you, you switch uh, the sum of K and the sum of T yeah. compared to, to the, so mathematics, are they the same or not? No. Okay. So <laughs> if you are in a supercomputer, it's the same, right? But uh -huh. uh, we're doing the uh, distributed network. So for each node, it ha only has its own data. So uh -huh. that's uh -huh. the difference. So here, if you want to transfer this, you need to transfer, you know, the, the 40, the time lapse, because that would be the whole wave field with the three dimension and the time T, right? So you need to uh -huh. transfer that the 40 data over the whole networks. You need to switch this information. But in our case, if we first collapse this uh, time domain in the local node, so in that one node, it will be an image. It will not be a movie. So in that yeah. way, that's yeah. the communication. Yeah, that's a, the good question because this distributed computing is not the same as the traditional computing. So we need to consider that. I will show the comparison of the communication cost later. So first, uh, let me uh, demonstrate the, the 
uh, location result. So you can see this is a single source location, and this is with the, uh, sorry, first it is noise free, and this is with noise. And we can also do the uh, location with multiple sources. So you can see this is noise free, and this is with noise. So the TRI methodology is very uh, kind of robust to the noises. And the later in uh, 2019, actually uh, a year ago, I think about, okay, when you do the stacking, actually you need to image, for example, this is the wave field from node one, this is the wave field from node two, wave field node three, wave field from node four. So you need to calculate the, all the view fields, and then for example here. So when you calculate this uh, source location, you need to actually uh, do the calculation of the whole possible view fields. So that's very time consuming. Can we just uh, calculate the very limited errors? So you know, if you are familiar with uh, Gaussian beam migration, so this kind of uh, idea from Gaussian beam migration. So we can only if, I mean, if we can only image these Gaussian beam areas, so we do not calculate other areas, so that will be much easier for us to do the calculation. Uh, so that would be uh, the way to improve the computation efficiency, right? And uh, you know, the Gaussian beam migration is a kind of is a high frequency, simple totic uh, solution to the wave field. And uh, it's based on actually the retracing method. So when we have the recenter, we can build this Gaussian beam around this wave, uh, this recenter, and uh, calculate this wave field, sorry, wave field within this Gaussian beam. But this is still, I mean, uh, very heavy in terms of calculation. Although it's already uh, light, lighter in lighter than the previous one because you need to do the coordinate uh, transmission and uh, you need to do the retracing to get the correct uh, the recenters. Can we do another way? So I propose a method is called the simplified Gaussian beam uh, time reversal imaging. So without calculating the retracing, I, I do a trick here. So I just do a beam forming. So with this beam forming, maybe I do not have the accurate these three curves, but we can, you know, give a large area, broad area that uh, to build these uh, Gaussian beam. So based on this beam, uh, beam, beam forming, we can also calculate the uh, this uh, micro seismic uh, source location. So compared with the traditional part. We only calculate these small areas. That would be the wave fields we need to calculate. So we improve the computation. And because we are transferring, what we are transmitting very small amount of data. So we also improve the communication. So here I'm showing an example. In the traditional TRI method, you need to calculate this whole wave field. But in our new proposal method, we only need to calculate this area. Yeah, so it's like a beam. So just so we calculate this beam. And then compared with other methodologies, so in terms of communication, in terms of computation, we have saved a lot of, you know, uh, communication and computation, improve the efficiency. And uh, these are some results. So you can see compared with the Traditional TRI methodology, this kind of is not very good because we do the uh, simplify. So because we do the simplify, the results is not very good, but we can still see like where is the source location, right? And then we also consider the different uh, signals to noise ratio. You can see 10 dB, 0 dB, negative 10 dB, negative 20 dB, and uh, our result kind of very stable. And then later, uh, we asked our, ourselves, when we got the distributed uh, uh, time reverse imaging result, can we improve that uh, the uh, kind of resolution or can we improve the accuracy of the location result? So we propose a methodology is called the least squares TRI. 
So in this methodology, we kind of do uh, these uh, squares uh, inverted to improve that uh, uh, location accuracy. And uh, these are the results. So here is the distributed uh, location results. You can see this quite a broad area, so you cannot actually know where is the exact location. And uh, here, you try to improve the result. And then this is the uh, least square TRI result. So we kind of significantly improve the location accuracy. And this is for the single event. And this is for the multiple events, you can see here. And besides the simulation results, we also did some tests in the field result. So this is from Iris uh, uh, data that deployed in 2016 in Oklahoma. And using our result, you can see uh, we got a very similar location uh, location result with the OG, OGS and another kind of uh, author. So, but you need to uh, be, you need to be notice that uh, in our data we only use a two D time we use we only use the two D time uh, survey. So we only use one trace of this uh, seismic data. But uh, from the OGS and from the other researchers work, they use the 3D, they use the whole uh, Oklahoma's uh, velocity uh, model. So in that way, they should be more accurate than us. But uh, we got a very acceptable result using just a one, using just a one time, uh, one time seismic trace uh, survey and uh, using the initial velocity model divided by ourselves. Yeah, so we are very uh, encouraged by this result. And after talking about the, the seismic, uh, micro seismic imaging, and uh, here uh, the, we got another kind of interesting news from the facilities office from the UGA, you know, when the UGA folk, folks, they know our methodology, they are t asking us like, can you do some uh, kind of time-lapse monitoring? I mean, can you imagine the water leakage from the pipelines? So that's a quite an interesting uh, problem because the water leakages from a pipeline can cause uh, shallow velocity variations, right? So this can be imaged by our system. And uh, we use uh, the subsurface, uh, uh, subsurface, sorry, we use the surface wave imaging methodologies. In this way, we take advantage of the relay waves. And uh, here, as I talked about, we uh, develop uh, our method based on the Archie's uh, work is called a spatial autocorrelation spec. So that was developed in 1957. So that was a very classic methodology. So this spec kind of transmits the spatial correlation into the uh, temporal correlation. So that is kind of the convenience of it. And uh, consider the uh, the correlation in terms of the relay wave and uh, this uh, spy coefficient can be expressed as the ratio between, you know, the uh, as a mutually average the spatial operation with the center values. And uh, this can also be expressed in terms of the base L function. And the way this base L function constraint, we can also solve this uh, base L function with the uh, least uh, squares uh, kind of uh, approach. And uh, our contribution is like, because we are using a distributed sensor networks. So we are not doing the traditional uh, least squares uh, spec. So we develop uh, is called a weighted least squares, uh, sorry, weighted uh, specs. So in this weighted spec, we gave the different uh, coefficient of the different nodes based on where it locates, for example, this is our networks. So there are some central nodes, for example, the D node is central node. And there are some boundary nodes, like the A, node A and the node B. So 
So in this way, different nodes will be assigned with different uh, weights. So in that way, we can get a, a more stable uh, kind of subsurface image result. And uh, here, uh, okay, we can, based on the, uh, the spec coefficient, we can estimate the phase velocities. And this is how can we build the phase velocity with the spec coefficient. And uh, the example is here, when we get the spec coefficient and we use the fundamental base L function, and then we can estimate these uh, uh, phase velocities. Here, this is the whole workflow of the, this spec methodology. And with the spec, we can generate this 3D velocity model. And in our work, after we get this 3D velocity model, we can do a time lapse. Uh, uh, we can do a time lapse uh, matter. So think about we only calculate the, the velocity model, say, every two minutes. And we can keep doing this. So in this way, with different time tau, we can think about that this is like not a, only a camera, this can be viewed as a video or a movie. So in this way, we can get a time-lapse image result and we can do the monitoring instead of just a one-time imaging. And this is a field experiment because we cannot directly dig a hole in the, you know, in the campus. So we found one student's backyard and in the backyard, this is a water supply, and this is the sensor networks. Those are the GPS locations of the sensors. And here, these are the sensors, and this is the monitor. So actually, we build the mesh network. So those kind of sensor nodes, they communicated with each other using the Wi-Fi, and this a laptop is also connected with them using the Wi-Fi, so we can directly monitor the nodes, how their nodes are working. And this is another sort of video. So there are some labor work we need to do. We need to dig a hole and uh, drill you know, on the pipes, who let the pipe to leak some water. So it's not very deep, it's less than one meter. And then we set up the social networks. Okay. And then based on the sensor networks, we can imaging the velocity changing because this is like a, a three or four hours data. So this is the velocity field that we estimated. And then you can see the velocity field is changing when we pump in the water when there is a pop, uh, water leakage. So in that way, with the waters uh, flowing in that uh, soil, then the velocity is changing. Okay. And the, besides this, uh, I mean, noise imaging, micro seismic location, and uh, the spec method. So we have also have other kind of efforts related with how to optimize the imaging. So for example, the resilience strength. So in this part, because our system needs to be deployed in some uh, extreme, extreme environments, so we need to enhance the battery life. So we kind of formulate our uh, computation, computation problem into a kind of related with different tasks. So with this optimization part, we optimize the battery life of the whole networks. So with this uh, kind of optimal data, sorry, with this optimal data task distribution, ODTD method, we can improve the battery lives. For example, with this method, the batteries all survive. 
without this method, then some battery would be died before others. So that would cause like the whole network will fail. And these are some tables related with, with this uh, kind of our method. Most of the time, most of the uh, nodes will be survive. And uh, these are the real kind of uh, application. We put all the sensors on the uh, on the roof of our, of our building. You can see maybe there can be some snow, there can be some shadows, there can be, you know, a lot of different things would happen in the real applications. And uh, this is the kind of our battery levels of the different node, of different four nodes. So you can see using these uh, kind of OD, TD, Meister, after a while, all the units would have a very similar battery level, you see. So in that way, it keeps the whole network alive. Okay, because of time, I will briefly talk about the, the rest of my slides, sorry. Uh, so you can see, we also have done some work to improve the bandwidth and uh, improve the bandwidth considering different conditions, consider the communication with neighboring two nodes, neighboring four nodes, and uh, you know unlimited bandwidth. So we, need, we did some work on that area. And uh, we also improved the uh, communication and the computation patterns. In that way, we can save a lot of communication bounds. And uh, so in that way, because we save the communication and the computation, we can save a lot of energy. So here, we, you can see we save a lot of energies. And the others, we also have do some work to optimize the, uh, the survey, the acquisition systems. So here, this is sun, centralized approach. This is called a common so source tomography. This is a common receiver tomography. So using different uh, uh, acquisition kind of setups, we can also optimize this imaging. So let's come to the conclusion. Uh, first thing I want to say the real time and the in situ subsurface imaging, it kind of it is a geophysical sensor networks that can sense and uh, process uh, the geophysical sensor data and compute the 2D, 3D, even 4D imaging in real time in situ. And uh, this can be think about as a paradigm shift uh, approach. So here we use a lot of different uh, collaborations. For example, the sensor networks, uh, signal processing, distributed computing, seismic imaging, all together. So this is a combination of all the different areas. And uh, there are some challenges and uh, opportunities. For example, we can provide this system is a fully, fully automatic system. And uh, it can has a very fast competition. And uh, we can deal with different uh, data source. So for example, we can do, deal with different uh, sensors with uh, different uh, properties. So later, maybe we can consider about uh, the data confusion, uh, sorry, data fusion part. And uh, these are my collaborators. I want to thank them. Uh, and I want to thank with uh, uh, the NSF and the NASA JPL to uh, kind of support our research. And uh, these are some uh, references, uh, papers I have I published and uh, our group have published, yeah, for these uh, during my postdocs. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Fang Yu, for such a great talk. And anyone has any questions? If you have any question, you can just unmute and uh, ask. Yeah. Uh, Hongjie. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, your your voice is uh, quite uh, small. How about now? Oh, okay. A little better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have uh, I have two questions. The the first one is about the real time ambient noise imaging because. From well, from my point of view, for the ambient noise uh, tomography or imaging, we need to have long time, long, very long time or, or long time stacking to make the cross correlation stable. So I wonder if you can explain more about uh, 
why why is the case you can do it in real time? Yeah, so yeah, that's a tricky part. So we use real time. It's not like a, the formal uh, definition is like a once per second. So not that kind of level real time. Uh, we put this term as real time is compared with the traditional way. So traditional way, you need to use like weeks, even months to do the aminos imaging, right? But in our case, we use here, we point out that like we prepare every five minutes data because this is not a fixed number. This is related with like what frequency we are using. For example, in our case, we use like two hertz. The main, the dominant frequency of our data is two hertz. And then we consider the, how large is our survey and what kind of frequency we are using and what's the kind of the signal to noise ratio and so how, can, how dense is our such a network? So we consider all these things together. So we decided, okay, five minutes is good enough for us. So the things is like every five minutes, we can get a result. Every five minutes, we kind of reflect that result. So we call it a real time, but it's kind of a real time. <laughs> I see, okay. Yeah, yes. thanks to me. Okay, my, my second question is about the, the location, the event location using this RTM technique. You mentioned okay. you're using just one trees. So I, I wonder how is that possible? Because you can you have three or four unknowns, but how can you do it with only one trees? Oh, sorry. That's a mistake. What I talk about is like we only have a 2D, oh, it's called a 1D or 2D, I'm not sure. It should be a 2D uh, seismic uh, line, right? So we only have the that data. In the Iris uh, website, I that's the only data we downloaded. You're asking about this part, right? The, the one in Oklahoma you mentioned. Yes, yes. So this is from the Iris data set. So what I have is like we only have this 2D size, seismic data. It's from the 1D seismic trees. So we have the sensors in this uh, kind of one line. So this what I'm talking about. For others, for the OGS, the Oklahoma Geological Survey. Mm -hmm. uh, so for them, they have the, all the 3D uh, velocity model. They have all the, you know, even the data and the, this, here this uh, white star is their location result. And this, we only use this 2D seismic data and this is our result. So that's the reason I think this is very promising. We got a quite a good result. Is is the event right under this under this the array the sensor? No, it's not the directly under array. Is uh, it's like think about this is the array. So the event kind of has like a ten kilo kilo meters away from that uh, that uh, kind of survey, but uh, it's pretty nice already. Yeah, we consider the about the, the difference about that. So you're supposed to have a larger horizontal uncertainty in that case, right? Uh, yes, a little bit, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Following Hong Jian's question, I mean, later if we can have a 3D seismic array, uh, array like with, you know, that one would be much better because for this, uh, Earthquakes is very hard to really get a real earthquake. Yeah, so that's a kind of the challenging part. Yeah, yeah I have a question. Mm -hmm. So so you mentioned that uh, the node that it will only communicate with it, its neighborhood, right? Neighboring nodes, yes. Yeah, so basically then the offset will be very limited. So you may not be able to image it too deep, right? Yes. Okay. That's a really good question. Um, here. So as you, you can see, typically, for example, this is the source location and this would be the neighboring hood, right? So in that way, we cannot have a very large offset. Yeah. But we also doing some research, for example, we image some part here and we can communicate from this cluster with this cluster. 
So that's the part we can improve for the last part. In the last uh, step is the whole network levels uh, aggregation. For the velocity aggregation in that way, we can get a partial map from this part and the partial map from this part, from that part, from that part. So in the final aggregation, we can improve a little bit of that, uh, you know, the because missing the offset uh, issue. But uh, yes, so generally we can also say this is as good as the centralized word in terms of the data quality, but uh, we have advantages with like, efficiency with the easy to deploy. I mean, so that we have other advantages and our image final image result is kind of a successful result. So there is a kind of a trade off. Yeah. So, so the reason that you only communicate between the neighbors is yeah. because if it's too, too loud, too far away that the communication time will be unacceptable. Yes, that, that's the main reason for the communication. For example, in our small area applications, we can use the Wi-Fi, but the Wi-Fi, if you're larger than 20 or 30 meters, then the Wi-Fi will not be stable, right? So in yeah. our case, for the radius, the radius can be like one, one to two miles away, but if you are too far away, then the radius will not be stable. When you transmit the data, for example, you transmit the like five minutes data, you're gonna, yeah. Have a lot of interrupts. You're gonna lose the data. You're gonna lose the package during the transmission. So the main reason, yes, you are right. So using the neighboring point, uh, neighboring nodes is because of the communications, and the, with these communications constraint, we can only use the neighboring. Yes. So and another question for each node. Actually, the the computational capability will not be too big, right? No, no, but. Uh, you can think about your iPhone. Your iPhone is, your cell phone is getting more and more powerful nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Rather cheaper. <laughs> so, anyone have any additional questions? Uh, if there's no questions, I uh, will thank Lee again and uh, thanks for well, Thanks again for giving us such a great talk. So if you have any question, I think you can message from you in the Discord, right? You will, in, you will be online for another maybe several minutes. Yeah, <laughs> right. I will be online. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you have any 